When you make nachos, you have to make a lot of decisions. You have to decide on chips, cheese, proteins, toppings, condiments, and where all this is gonna go in your dish. Some ingredients can make every bite of your dish a little more perfect, while others can leave you with a damp and soggy mess. I'm Andrew Ray, AKA Babish, and today we're gonna see every decision I make to make the perfect tray of nachos. The beauty of nachos is that there's no definitive right or wrong way. It's entirely up to you. These are gonna be my choices, but they will not be arbitrary. It's best to do it with intention and logic. So let's move with intention and start by choosing chips. You might be surprised to learn that chips play a vital role in nachos. In searching for the perfect nacho chip, you want something that is structurally sound, not very absorbent, and isn't too loud on its own, doesn't bring in its own flavor to the party. I'm looking for a strong chip that has a distinct corn flavor. These are corn chips, which taste like corn. It's corn chips, nachos, corn. Right away, I'm going to say no on the Doritos. We're not making TikTok content here. Too much flavor, too much going on. I don't need the chip to be stealing the show. So Doritos, get out of here. These sort of multi-grain joints here, these guys, you know, they're, they, okay, no, they don't have very good rigidity. They're very fragile and they taste like multi-grain bread. In making nachos, what I'm looking for is something that is distinctly unhealthy, and this is at least trying to be healthy, so it doesn't have a place on my nacho tray. These are Sochil chips. It says how to pronounce it right there, which is fun. These, I think, are frankly the worst chips on the market. They have no structural rigidity. Let me show you something. This is salsa. This is the Sochil chip. Watch what happens. I can do this all day. There's nothing that it's gonna be able to stand up to in a nacho scenario, please. Tostitos scoops, kind of an odd choice because the whole point of this is for dipping. Nachos are like chips that have been dipped for you. It, it would work in a nacho situation, but I'd be a little confused. Tostitos original, this is a handsome option, but they're kind of a boring tasting chip. I wouldn't eat Tostitos by themselves. They definitely work in a nacho situation, but they're not my ideal pick. Tostitos lightly salted is the same thing, but with less salt and salt tastes good. So there's less of it, so there's less taste good. So I, yeah, no, it's probably not the move. These are Ola Nola chips. I don't know anything about them. I do know that they taste good. I love the original so much. These guys are hearty. They have very good strength to them. They're oily, they're flavorful. They're everything I'm looking for in a nacho chip. If you can't find these, really all you're looking for is thick, oily, flavorful, a little bit too big to fit in your mouth. These are the things gonna make up the perfect foundation for the house of nachos that you will then proceed to build. These are the chips that I'm choosing for my nachos. Now, let's take a look at cheese. Cheese is not only a huge visual element of nachos, it's a textural element. You want a really soft, young cheese that's gonna melt beautifully, blanket your nachos, and stretch pornographically every time you pull a chip. Too aged a cheese, too old a cheese, it's going to break, it's gonna become oily, and might even become gritty if it's overheated in the oven. It's very easy to make a mistake when choosing cheese for your nachos, and the first and most pronounced one you can make is this, pre-shredded cheese. So these guys are coated in anti-caking agents, potato starch or corn starch or some kind of starch. You can see that they're dusty and that is to prevent them from sticking together in the bag. You don't wanna buy a bag of shredded cheese and it turn into a, a lump at the bottom. This has the unfortunate disadvantage of ruining both the look and the texture of the cheese on your nachos. We have here some cheese that we shredded ourselves versus cheese that was pre-shredded. We threw it in the oven and look what happened. A lot of the shreds have kept their shape. It's not a good look on nachos. That and I'm gonna press a paper towel onto each of these cheeses. You can see the amount of oil that has leached out of the pre-shredded cheese. Worst cheese experience for a nacho style environment. What, what prankster put Gruyere on this table? It's insane. Not only because it has really, really strong, funky aged flavor, but also because just that, it's aged. So for the actual cheese that's going on my nachos, I'm going with these three guys. First up, Oaxaca. The closest thing that you're gonna get to mozzarella on the table here. It's extremely stretchy. It's an excellent melter. Very inoffensive in flavor, but it's gonna bring a lot of great texture and a lot of great stringy, porny meltiness. Next up, we've got pepper jack. This is probably my favorite cheese on the planet. 
I could snack, I could eat this whole bar making eye contact with you the entire time. Not blinking, not breathing, I could do it. Fantastic melter, it's a young cheese, it's one of the best melting cheeses on the market. Last but not least, we have queso de papa. This is a Longhorn style cheddar. I guess Longhorn only refers to its mezzaluna shape. All it really is, is a very mild young cheddar. Mild and young, like me, not really. Beard's turning gray, not so much anymore. Spicy, old, that's me. This is the opposite, mild, young, better analogy. <laughs> we also have mild cheddar cheese here. This is effectively the same thing. It would work just as effectively. You'd never know the difference. So these are the cheeses that I'm picking. I'm grating them myself so I have control over the shred size and what kinds of cheeses are going in there. If you do larger shreds, they're gonna maintain their separateness so that you can evenly coat your nachos with shreds. This is so much better than the pre-shredded cheese. By weight, it's more expensive and you're getting a worser product. So grate your own cheese for God's sake. So now I'm doing the pepper jack and the addition of little bits of chili and red pepper in there brings just enough heat where it's not going to numb out your in-laws who can't handle spicy food. I never know what to do with cheese toward the end. It's like, do I grate my fingers? Do I go all the way? There we go. Last up, the Oaxaca, and this is gonna be a little bit harder to shred. What you can do is throw this guy in the freezer for about 15 minutes to make it easier to grate. It's like trying to grate a snake. That's enough. I'm just adding this for stretch factor, not so much for flavor, so. These are the cheeses that are going on my nachos. Let's get the rest of this stuff out of here. So now, let's talk protein. Protein's a great way to add flavor and texture and protein to your nachos, and it really is what takes it more from a snack to a full meal. You don't necessarily need it, but if you're gonna call them deluxe nachos on the menu, it better have protein on it, because I'm not paying extra. Let's talk pork. Pork is an excellent option for nachos, but it's pretty labor intensive because you can't just chop this up and throw it on your nachos. This is a slow and low cut. Ideally, you wanna make like carnitas out of this. Maybe if you made a little bit too much carnitas for taco night last night, it's an excellent use for it. Uh, next up, we have chorizo. This is my personal favorite. A little bit spicy, it's a ton of flavor. Very easy to prepare for the nachos. You just have to fry it up. We have chicken breast, which is a wholly inappropriate option for nachos. Chicken breast is extremely lean. It dries out super quickly. It has little to no flavor of its own. I want something that's really bringing a personality to the party. So I'm not gonna go chicken breast. We have shrimp, which I am first off, not a shrimp and cheese kind of person. Not my bag. That and shrimp, when overcooked, becomes stringy and chewy and bouncy and gross. And you have to cook it first. You can't just throw raw shrimp on your nachos. You're out of your mind. And then you have to throw the whole thing in the oven. So you're going to overcook your shrimp. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not a big fan. I'm going chorizo because it's quick, it's easy, and it's gonna bring a whole lot of flavor to the party. Let's make some chorizo. You wanna get raw chorizo. It's appetizing, no? I'm going straight into a cold pan because this stuff is so greasy and fatty. It's, you don't need to oil the pan. You can, of course, break things up with a wooden spoon like this, but this is a bit more efficient way to effectively turn this into ground meat. There we go. All right, this stuff is fully cooked, broken up, and draining on paper towels. It's nacho ready. Let's get the rest of this stuff out of here. Now let's talk about vegetables. So like most nacho elements, we're looking for flavor and texture here. I am a fan of virtually everything on this table, except for this stuff. I am one of those people who is genetically averse to cilantro. That being said, I recognize how most people think cilantro tastes delicious and how it is an essential part of garnish in nacho cuisine. So we are including it in spite of my genetic deficiency. Onion, red onion in particular, I think is an excellent addition to nachos. It looks great, tastes great, adds a little crunch. Fresh jalapenos are awesome for heat, and for color, and for jalapeno-ness, but I prefer pickled jalapenos because these guys bring a little bit of that briny, sour bite to them. So it brings a, a flavor entirely different from anything else on this table. A lot of people love putting olives on their nachos. That eludes me personally, but I think we're gonna treat our nachos not unlike a pizza. One half with olives, the other half with jalapenos or something like that. So people will get a little bit of choice in the matter. They get a say. Raw bell peppers. A little bit too much crunch from wet. So I'm not gonna do raw bell pepper personally. 
Another nacho topping that you'll see pretty often is radishes. A very nice earthy flavor. Maybe we'll do half with radishes on it. Who knows? It's our pizza. I mean, nachos. So red onion, you don't need much of it. Not super fine diced. I want to know that I'm eating an onion. I don't want it to be ambiguous. Radishes, just going to want to slice into thin little rounds. I don't have very professional knife skills. You could use a mandolin if you really don't value the tips of your fingers. Drain pickled jalapenos. You don't want to add sog to your chips, so I'm making sure that I'm getting as much liquid out of here as possible. I might even pat them dry on paper towels if I really want to be fastidious. I think these guys are going to bring a good mix of crunch, flavor, personality to my nachos. So this is what I'm going with. Next up, condiments. These are things that would go on a bite, not on the nachos themselves, certainly not in the oven. I don't think any of these things you would want to get hot. One of the more essential condiments with nachos, I think, is guacamole. You're definitely going to want to make your own guacamole because avocado almost immediately oxidizes when you cut into it. So even the slim quote fresh stuff in the fridge section has absorbic acid to make sure that it doesn't turn brown. It uses lime juice concentrate, fresh lime juice, it is so much better than bottled lime juice. If you don't believe me, squeeze a fresh lime into your mouth and maybe don't do that, but it, it just, just trust me. And it's not hard to make your own guacamole. It takes five minutes. You wanna make sure that you've got nice ripe avocados. When you press your finger into the outside, it should yield a little bit. If you're really desperate and you need ripe avocados right now, you can actually put them in a low oven, like a 200 degree Fahrenheit oven for like 20 minutes. That does make their flesh soft. I want to add red onion, bring flavor, color, and crunch. I'm going garlic crusher. The more you break down garlic, the more garlic flavor you're gonna get out of it. So this is a way to really bust up your garlic. Need lime juice for flavor and also the acid. It helps preserve the color of the guac. Half teaspoon of cumin in there. And a pinch of salt, freshly ground pepper, and mash them up with a fork until you reach your desired consistency. Some people like a chunkier guac, some people like it to be smooth as 90s jazz. A little bit of fresh jalapeno for spice, and of course, some of the devil's lettuce. And yeah, see that still has a little bit of avocado texture in it, still got some chunks in there. You know, which one would you rather have? I'll wait. Next thing we gotta do, is a fresh salsa or pico de gallo. Once again, gonna be worlds better than anything you can get at the store. I have some nice ripe tomatoes on the vine. I'm going for a pretty chunky pico. Going with white onion because it is mellower than the red onion. It's obviously you want a lower ratio of onion to tomato. Uh, you could chop the garlic, but I'm just gonna press it again. It's almost the same thing as guacamole, but with tomatoes instead of avocados. What do you think about that? Go one lime on this guy, a little bit of salt, a bit of pepper. Last thing I'm gonna add is a little bit of heat, and this time in the form of hot sauce. It's not spicy, it just adds a little personality. It's a very quick, simple, and easy pico de gallo. Pretty as you please, fresh as a daisy. All right, so something else we're taking a look at is crema, a cultured sour cream that is a little thinner, so it's drizzleable, and it's tangier. The, out of the jar is fantastic. Um, but it's not very easy for everybody to find. So to make a rough at-home approximation, we can just take regular old sour cream, plop, plop, and both thin it and tangify it with lime juice. We just wanna get this to the consistency where it is like pourable, like drizzleable. Man, all these limes makes me want a margarita. And that, there we go. See, that's about as close as you can get to real crema without using real crema. Perfect. Last but not least, beans. I don't like beans. I'm not a beans guy. When I make chili, I make chili con carne without beans. That being said, most people do like beans on their nachos. I don't see the value to putting them directly on the nachos. They're not very flavorful. They're bringing some protein, some fiber to the mix, but they're not like really tasty. So why not go all the way and use refried beans? These guys have been cooked and then recooked in pork fat. So go refried beans if you ask me. All right, so I have my various condiments. I think that's all I need here. Let's get this stuff out of here. Well, dear viewer, do you know what time it is? It's nacho time. I'm gonna build my nachos on a sheet tray. You wanna maximize surface area and minimize depth. They're this tall, they're not gonna get heated through all the way, and if they do, the outside's gonna get burnt. And the more surface area, the better. That means more chips are gonna get more stuff on them. 
I do my nachos in two layers. First, a, a bedrock of chips, hit only with cheese, nothing else. I'm gonna combine all the cheeses in a bowl so that they are evenly distributed together. Not too heavy a layer on this first layer. If you overload the cheese, you're gonna get soggy chips. And we also wanna make sure that we have enough cheese for the top layer. Our picture perfect chips on top of that. This is perhaps being a little too precious. We're, we're recording this. If you're doing this in your house, just dump it on there. Even though it's just chips and cheese, this already looks festive. Just wait till we get all the stuff on it. I like to do cheese then toppings, both because it looks better and because it insulates our chips from getting too soggy. And make sure that as few chips as possible lay naked on your sheet tray. Don't want that. It's a family show. No naked chips. The only toppings we're putting on the nachos right now are ones that we want heated up. I'm gonna start with the chorizo. Nice and toasty. This is, might be the most flavorful sausage known to man. That looks pretty good. Some of my vegetables get a little bit of heat, so I'll throw some red onion down. This isn't in the oven for an appreciable amount of time to really cook anything but like onions like heat. We're gonna do half with jalapenos, and I appear to be shingling them in a pattern. I didn't mean to when I started, but now here we are. And then the other half, we'll do olives. Look at all the flavors, textures, and colors we've layered. Like, nobody could look you in the eye and tell you that these aren't fully loaded nachos. If they did, you would legally be in the rights to place them under citizen's arrest. The rest of this stuff, we don't want to put in the oven. So we've got our nachos built. Let's get these in the oven. Give me one minute. These guys just got out of the oven. Now it's time to garnish. Add some radishes to the olive side of the situation. They're gonna add a little bit of crunch, a little bit of earthy goodness. I'm gonna drizzle on some crema. Just devil may care style. You don't wanna make soggy chips, just want to bring a little bit of this tangy stuff to the party. I'm gonna pile these various dips in the corners. So that way they're not intruding, they're not getting overheated, they're just ready to go. Some pico, which I'm going to do my best to drain. Like we obviously are gonna get a little bit of liquid with the pico. I'm gonna do what I can to mitigate that. And uh, how about two refried bean stations? We'll do one on this side and one up front. For garnish, some picked cilantro. Big old leaves that I can pick off. And that is my tray of fully loaded nachos. My ultimate nachos. I love the pickled jalapenos and I do like the olives because they bring that nice little briny sourness and that's a really nice contrast against all the richness and cheese and all that stuff. Chips are still nice and crisp, holding their shape. Mm. The guac is well seasoned, creamy, it's fantastic. It's, it's, my, it's my favorite plate of nachos. And as you can see, look at that. These chips are not yielding to all the toppings that they are burdened with carrying. My ideal nachos are loaded and layered just like these, but they're just that, they're my ideal nachos. Your ideal nachos might look wholly different. Whatever decisions you make are fine, they are yours. Just make sure that you make them with intention. That's how you're gonna end up with the best final product.